Welcome friends to the channel. Today's topic, as you can see in the screen, No One Writes to the Colonel, a very renowned text filled with different aspects of literature, specifically magic realism, a very newer concept in literature by the writer himself, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 1927 to 2014, a renowned writer of magic realism. And we will experience how that magic realism is working in this text no one writes to the colonel so without wasting time just let's get started the first thing that the novel no one writes to the colonel the original title as you can see screen written on the screen is a novella written by colombian author gabriel garcia marquez published in 1961 it is one of marquez's most celebrated works and showcases many of the themes and stylistic elements for which he became famous, as I have already said this. The story is set in a small, impoverished coastal town in Colombia during an undetermined time period characterized by political unrest and economic struggle. So that political unrest and economic struggle will be found later on when we will discuss step by step the total novel. The protagonist of this novella is an old retired colonel fought in the Thousand Days' War. A civil conflict in Colombia during the late 19th and 20th centuries. So this is the basic aspect of the um, novella that the colonel who remains unnamed throughout the story is waiting for his pension and how uh, did he get his um, conflict out of his mind and how uh, did he keep his dignity till the end? This is the aspect of the novella. So this is not about a pension. This is not about the money. This is more about the people, the more about the, their struggle, more about the dignity that they have to keep with him or her. So the narrative revolves around the colonel's daily life and his persistent hope of receiving his pension. Now let us talk about the narrative. The narrative revolves around the colonel's daily life and his persistent hope of receiving his pension. Each Friday, the colonel walks to the post office to check for any letters from the government. However, week after week, he finds disappointments. As there are no letters for him, the absence of correspondence becomes symbolic of the colonel's isolation, abandonment and neglect by the government. While the central focus, as this is also significant, what is the central focus of the novel? Central focus is on the colonel and his wife. The novel also explores the lives of other characters in the town. The townspeople struggle to survive, facing poverty, violence, and the corruption. Through these secondary characters, Marquez highlights the wider socio-political aspects of the novel as an impact indeed upon the individual and the people of the town. Now, as I was talking about magic realism, this is also found in this text because this is a writing style of Marquez characterized by his use of magic realism, a literary technique where magical or fantastical elements are presented in an otherwise realistic setting. So in this novella, Marquez blends mundane and ordinary events with moments of magical realism. So nothing uh, more here. When we will discuss, you can understand what is magic realism, how that is applied throughout that story, throughout the novella. You will get it soon. Next, move on to the themes of the novel. The novel exposed themes such as an powerlessness, hope, dignity, and the human spirit's resilience in the face of adversity. The colonel's unwavering determination to hold on to his dignity, as this I was talking about, and maintain hope despite the odds stacked against him, is a central aspect of the story. So, despite all these themes, there are certain other themes that have characterized, and I will discuss about them individually later on. Now, let us move on to the other parts of the novella. The first one is that significant points to understand or to be discussed. That these are the points, the rooster, the significance of the rooster, the narrative pattern, characters, magic realism, and significant themes. That little bit I have said earlier. The first thing, as you can understand, is the significance of the rooster. The rooster as you have seen, serves a powerful symbol that carries several layers of meaning throughout the story. There are certain categorization, there are certain factors, one, two, three, four. I have divided them into four segments that the rooster is a symbol of hope. Second is the representation of dignity. Third is defiance and resistance. And fourth is illusory nature. So why rooster is so significant? Because it carries the symbol of hope 
The rooster symbolizes colonel's hope for a better future. Colonel and his wife have been waiting for years to receive a pension owed to them by the government for the colonel's services during the civil war. The rooster, which they plan to raise and sell, represents their last chance to make some money and improve their impoverished life. Second significant aspect is that the rooster is the representation of dignity. Why? Because colonel's pride and dignity are replete, are connected with this rooster. Despite the desperate circumstances, the colonel refuses to give up and remains determined to assert this worth and honor. The rooster becomes a symbol in this respect of his refusal to, de to be defeated by poverty and his commitment to pursuing his dignity in the face of neglect and indifference from the authorities. There are ample references to the text of where colonel is completely and repeatedly neglected. Still, the rooster on the background suggests that the hope still lying within the mind of the colonel and also it is a symbolical uh, aspect which gives the dignity uh, the standpoint to uh, to stand alone third is defiance and resistance the rooster serves also as a symbol of resistance against the oppressive political regime the colonel's persistence in raising the rooster and preparing it for cockfight becomes an act of defiance against the corrupt government so see how shrewdly this becomes a symbolical significance. First of all, before understanding this, there is no such uh, summary of the text. You cannot expect summary because this is an analysis. And for summary, this is a very short novella. You can read it by yourself. If still you cannot do it, just go to the summary. There are several other materials you can find in Google and in YouTube. So from there, just go through the summary, then try to understand the thematic aspects and the significant points that I am discussing right now. So the defiance resistance after the resistance part that by betting on the rooster's victory, the colonel challenges the authorities refusing to succumb to their control and exploitation. So the same rooster again and again becomes a symbol in different aspects. Number fourth is illusory nature. The rooster's significance also lies in its illusory nature. Throughout the novel, the colonial books and dreams are repeatedly shattered. And the rooster for, fails to win any cockfights. The rooster's inability to bring the anticipated change represents the harsh reality of a world where dreams often go unrealized. It highlights the themes of disillusionment and the cruel nature of life, where even symbols of hope and defiance can be rendered futile. So, from this perspective, the rooster's illusory nature is also connected with the conditions of the colonel and his wife in the town. The next is the narrative pattern that I have talked a very little about. In almost traditional style, the narrative structure of no one writes to the colonel has an omniscient narrator outside the story, not a participating character. So, the narrator is not participating in the storyline. However, he is acting as an omniscient narrator commenting from outside. So Garcia Marquez reveals a unique design for the use of time. His frequent indication of exact hour and minute or a recurring mention of the day or the month or both, a suggestion that time is static. And finally, an occasional reference to clocks proves how effective the concept of time is for the development of both personality and theme. The narrative structure of the novella pays particular attention to the present time. So time is here a very significant point. Because if you cannot follow the time, ordinarily, you can understand the novella is nothing but just a, a simple description of two or three people or the townspeople or very mundane affairs. But it is not. You have to be a detective. The point that I have cleared on the next slide, but before that, let me discuss it a bit, that you have to be a detective for, to understand the references of time. The present time is so shrewdly is given that you, if, you, if you do not understand the references one after another, you cannot get the novel. So basically, the reader has to be a detective. The story starts on October 27 and ends on December 7, a period of six weeks. The narration, however, expands over a much longer period of time. From the very start, the reader is taken back time, uh, in time when the colonel's wife recalls the year the dead son was born, 1922. In fact, their son was born on March 7, 1922 and was killed by the police nine months before the start of the story on January 3. 
of, at a cockfight where he was distributing clandestine literature. Their son, Augustine, walked at a tailor shop and was a cockfight fanatic. The omniscient narrator then recalls an incident when the family was happy and their son Augustine was eight. This makes the year 1930 because 1922 to plus 8, 1930. But readers in this instance only get the reference to the incident, not the exact year when it happened. So see, there is a jumbling up. So stepping up to the one year to eight years up. So you have to follow the time references. You have to follow the years. Without following the years, you cannot get what the narrative is taking you to somewhere. Again, the present tense of the narrative elapses only one week before the colonel gets ready to go pick up the mail. Once again, however, a regression in time is noted by the omniscient narrator. Fifteen years of waiting had sharpened his intuition. It's in, it is in page number six. The text I will give you with the uh, page num numbers in the description. You can find the text in the description from there you can download the text so you can get the references from that text from that translation the colonel receives nothing that friday uh, nor the following the narrative structure refers to the past again on to august 12 1949 to inform the reader that the colonel was put on the rolls to receive a pension on this debt congress had passed the law to outward or uh, law to award congress had passed the law to award pensions to those who fought to defend the republic 19 years ago but it took eight years to prove the colonel's claim then uh, and then six years to get him included in the rules the narrative structure moves in a linear fashion therefore as you can understand both in the past and in the present simultaneously in relation to the past, it starts with the birth of Augustine in 1922 and moves on to 1949. This is a simultaneous movement, a linear pattern. Both are moving simultaneously. The present time of the six weeks of narration moves from the end of October, the first week of December, although, detect although the year is never mentioned. The reader, if interested, has to apply detective has to play detective and pay attention to dates and incidents, piecing together disparate allusions to complete an accurate timeline. So this is not an easy task. So if you have to read, no one writes to the colonel, you have to understand the timeline first. Then you can get into the story. Then you can understand what is actually happening. So this is just a small instance. You can get these instances throughout the story. So from this, you can understand how interesting and to some extent how difficult the novella is. Now, so much for the detective play. Let us move on to the characters. So there are lots of characters because character development in the novella depends on the consciousness of the omniscient narrator and the consciousness of the characters as they interact with one another as the plot unwinds. The main characters of the novella are the colonel and his wife, and the rooster, none of the three, however, is given proper name. Very interesting. The secondary characters are numerous. They include Sabas, the doctor, the postman, the lawyer, the town's mayor, uh, Father Angel, Augustine's friends, Alvaro, Alfonso, and Jarman, Sabas' wife, Moses, the Syrian, Augustine, etc. With these main and secondary characters, the novelist tries to present that the whole town is present in the novella. The whole town is present in that very short framework of the novella. Though he creates a, an illusion that the whole town is present as the reader moves through the story. The consciousness of the omniscient narrator reveals the characters as past and the consciousness of the characters adds to their own personalities. In this manner, a character who is never present, never depicted in the text, becomes the most important of the secondary characters. Augustine first emerges as a mere reference, but gradually evolves to become an important symbol of guidance and subversion. So, manner is very typical. The character who is never present, never depicted in the text, becomes the most important one. For example, Augustine. So, Augustine's presence is not there in the text, but Augustine is undoubtedly present everywhere. So, without his presence, the Domela may be uh, incomplete. So the first character that we would like to get the informations from uh, the text is about Colonel. 
one of the three main characters of the narrative. The colonel is the most significant or important. The colonel, however, is developed in opposition to his wife. From the start, he is a character drowning in extreme poverty. The opening lines pictures him scourging to prepare himself a small cup of coffee in a country known for its coffee plantations. His umbrella is nearly completely, dis completely destroyed by the moths. He has to shave by Phil since he does not want a mirror. His house is mortgaged and he and his wife often boil stones in the cooking pot to fool the neighbors into thinking they are not as destitute as they seem to be or as they really are. What readers may ask themselves skips the colonel hopeful even everyone else seems to have given up. Is it because he has a hope that a letter to confirm his pension will be a form of recognition for his merit in war? These two rhetorical questions can be answered with one word. He has dignity. So the colonel, although very poor, poverty stricken, but he keeps his dignity still to the end. In fact, he is not only poor, but the system that has impoverished him financially has also killed his only son. From the age of 20, the colonel has been going from one frustration to the next. His wife no longer trusts him or his decisions for all uh, have been failures. The country's authorities are totally indifferent to his situation. The colonel at first glance appears pathetic. His wife, for example, is always reproaching him um, for his lack of character, for his stubbornness to keep the rooster. For his insistence in hoping for a letter that never arrives, his destiny, if there is one, seems to be a miserable one, yet he conquers all. His personality seems to be like that of Don Quixote. His dream, like Don Quixote's, may also be impossible. The colonel constitutes the fight, never loses hope, and truly believes that in the end, through the cockfight, he will finally win. So, is that everlasting hope continuously emerging within the colonel. To the end, that the colonel is the idealized strength that can face the misery of everyday life with a spiritual richness. He is never defeated because he never gives up. He is far removed from the reality that surrounds him, but not blind to what he experiences. The ominous present does not stop him from the dreaming of a better future. Now, if we uh, move back to the last page of the text, where you can find that um, the last lines, it had taken the colonel 75 years, the 75 years of his life, minute by minute to reach this moment. He felt pure, explicit, invincible at the moment when his um, replied shit. So there is that invincibility, there is that purity completely. Uh, still, he has managed to keep it up within himself. So this is colonel. There are references from which you can gather materials of colonel's characteristic features. So these are the basic aspects of colonel's character. Now move on to the next character that is colonel's wife. In contrast, the colonel's wife is not a dreamer or idealist. She is simple, strong, faithful, hardworking, long-suffering and a true religious believer. She is small, thin and asthmatic. If she undergoes a flare-up in her asthma, she simply waits until the crisis is over. When the crisis is over, she cleans the house and keeps it as best as she can. She is capable of performing the miracle of multiplying the bread, says the colonel. She can also see you, mend and restore. It is as if she had found a key to sustaining uh, a domestic economy where money is non-existent. She adapts to their poverty, although it begets misery. So she is completely opposite of colonel. Where colonel never accepts defeat, doesn't matter to colonel's wife. Whatever is going on, it just passes on. It just passes on. So it is not a matter of fact whether she has to struggle or not. She just accepts. She is not an idealistic person like the colonel. The colonel's wife has a harsh and strong temperament. This makes her inflexible, especially in the face of adversity. The death of their son caused her to shed not a single tear, but the unjustified situation in which the leave makes her scream against her own husband and against society as a whole. Unlike the colonel, she is forceful and decisive. Her decisions are all practical, also unlike the colonel. However, she is the one who suffers most from reality. So she is one hand realistic and because of her realism, she suffers most. There is a little bit of uh, idealism in 
the colonel because he keeps the dignity and therefore because he lives in a don quixote mode means in an idealistic philosophy and the world of a dream colonel is not believing something realistic like his wife on the other hand colonel's wife is giving her best to understand the situation realistically so because realism keeps her alive it keeps also misery to the lifestyle However, little by little, she starts to question her husband until finally she rebels against the situation into which they have fallen. She rebels with a voice filled with anger, starting to that she is up to her tonsils of res resignation and pride. This state of affairs reminds her of the conditions that destroyed the town's economy. She remembers the time when senators would make a thousand pesos a month for 20 years without doing anything. She remembers their friend Sabas, a man who came to town selling medicines on the streets with a snake around his neck and who now lives in a two-story house and enjoys great wealth. She screams all this at her husband to convince him that dignity cannot feed them. So this is the realistic part of her life. This is the realism in her character. She knows very well that dignity doesn't matter at all because dignity cannot give you food. Dignity can give you money. So if the colonel is believing that dignity, colonel's wife is completely going opposite to him. And she's shouting, she's screaming at him because she understands that these people like Sabas, people like Sabas, uh, are the representative figure of the political, economical, uh, political destruction, economical destruction, because these people get their best, whether people like Colonel received nothing. So these are the aspects in Colonel's wife. Now, Except these two characters, the colonel and his wife, there are other characters like Augustine, their son, their only son. Augustine's character development is analogous with the life of St. Augustine. He too lived a life of rebellion against his mother's will. Augustine rebelled against the town's police and in incited his friends to, to do uh, likewise, as did St. Augustine, who incited his friends to fight against those who were taking heaven by force. The leadership of St. Augustine was passed on to the order he founded, uh, the Augustinian order. Augustine's legacy in the novel is passed on to the others and left open-ended. His father, the old colonel, decides both to carry on the cockfight tradition by keeping the rooster and to distribute clandestine literature. So both are carried forward by the old colonel. His son, that means Augustine's um, idealism, are also transferred to his father. The next one is Sabas, who represents the sector of society that has benefited from the violence suffered by the townsfolk. He is the only member of the colonial's political party who escaped political persecution, which did by siding uh, with the government forces through his friendship with the town's mayor. So these are very realistic factors. These are very political and economical sections which are given through the characterization of Sabas. His house is a new building reflecting his newfound wealth. Sabas is a person without scruples, dedicated to business, whether honest or not. Sabas represents the new ruling class. The humanitarian qualities of the doctor are the antithesis, direct contrast of Sabas. Through him, the reader gets a fresh and critical viewpoint of the outside world. So there are different representations of people. On the one hand, as you have a colonel and his wife and Augustine, on the other hand, the new class, the ruling people, the economy, the politics are represented by Sabas. So he is also a stronger character. The next one is the lawyer who is depicted as the bureaucrat representing the political system in the town. In 15 years, he has not accomplished what he was hired for to make sure that the colonel received his pension. The lawyer is shown as disinterested, only capable of arguing in terms of names, dates, and excuses. The town's mayor is another pretty official whose authority is exercised in a dictatorial manner. When he persecutes people, they either die or leave the town. His accomplice in crime is Sabas. Father Angel adds the moral censorship of the church to the already repressive system. He announces by ringing the church bells, which movies are appropriate for the public and which are not. However, Father Angel does not decide on his own. So these are the little characters, not insignificant, but their significance lies in different aspects of the novella. So indicating different situations, moments and uh, significance or significant points of the text now leaving these characters let us understand one 
uh, significant point that I have just said is the magic realism. Now, what is magic realism? Uh, while no one writes to the colonel is not as widely recognized as some of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's other books, such as 100 Years of Solitude, which is a very significant text, it does contain elements of magic realism. You now, what is magic realism? It is a literary style that combines realistic narrative with fantastical or magical elements, often blurring the lines between the ordinary and the extraordinary. Here are a few instances of the magic realism in this text. The no one writes to the colonel, like the rooster is an aspect of magic realism. The weather is also another aspect of magic, magic realism. And the third one is the ghost of Augustine. So how they are the examples of magic realism, let us, found, find, let us find it out. The first one is a magic realism example, is the rooster. One of the most prominent examples of magic realism in the novel is the character of the rooster. The colonel and his wife have a rooster that they keep with the hope of using it for crop fighting. However, the rooster never grows, which is seen as a bad omen. The rooster becomes a symbol of hope and anticipation of the colonel, requesting that his dreams for a better future. Its silence and eventual death are significant magical elements that evoke a sense of mystery and foreshadowing. So this is something magical that we cannot expect a rooster without its growing. So without its growing, it seems that uh, it is moralistically dead. So the magic realism is here that the combination between the mundane and the super uh, sounding materials that is fantastical, something not very real. So these are the mixture of elements in this particular aspect of rooster. The second one is the weather. Throughout the novel, the weather plays a symbolic role, how often reflecting the colonel's emotional state and the struggles uh, he faces. This reminds us of King Lear that when Lear is going out, uh, the outside storm is a representation of his inside storm. So this is somehow similar that the colonel's emotional state and struggles are represented by the weather. The relentless rain and storms that constantly better the coastal town can be interpreted as a metaphor for the colonel's ongoing hardships and the oppressive political climate. Uh, of the time. So the use of weather to convey emotional and atmospheric elements adds to touch of magic and symbolism to the narrative. The third one is the ghost of Augustine. The colonel son Augustine died many years ago in the civil war. However, his presence continues to haunt the colonel's thoughts and dreams. Augustine's ghost appears intermittent, intermittently in the narrative, engaging in conversations with the colonel. These interactions blur the boundaries between the living and the dead infusing the story with an outwardly or otherworldly element. And in this way, these three aspects become uh, the examples of magic realism in the text. Now, if you can find more examples, you can share with us uh, in the comment section. Uh, and I am hoping that you will certainly comment on it. Now, leaving to the magic realism aspect, let us move on to the thematic issues. There are different themes. Uh, the first one is the corruption and violence. It is obvious that corruption is the main theme of No One Rights. The colonel and the corruption and violence that Colombia has undergone from the civil wars uh, of the 19th century right through to the 20th century are portrayed through two generations. The old colonel and his wife and those in power represent the older generation and Augustine and his friends the younger generation. As the younger generation protests the dictatorship of the 1950s, the old colonel, with indignation, remembers the last war of 19th century and points out the corruption of the bureaucracy and its chief officials that accompanied it. At the time, the old colonel was a very young man living in Mokando. The Treaty of Neerlandia had been signed, yet the colonel had to wait for 10 years to see the promises of the treaty fulfilled. Meanwhile, Mokando was inundated with people from out of town who came here to work in the booming economy uh, of the banana plantations. This new social and economic way forced the proud and dignified colonel to leave Macondo. It also marked the beginning of a period in which the country was engulfed by despair, frustration, oppression, corruption, solitude, violence, and death. So this is the historical references of uh, corruption and violence in the text. So, colonists uh, leaving of Macondo and the new emergence of people are the systematic beginning of corruption and violence. The colonel's misfortune, which began when he left Macondo, permits the entire book, as we have already understood this. 
Initially, he was still young and strong and believed that things might change for the better. The colonel was and continues to be throughout the uh, book hopelessly optimistic, which I have already commented earlier. Yet life in the story only gets worse. The young colonel and his wife grow old, physically decrepit, very um, sick and shamelessly poor. Moreover, the violence of the time of the narrative is so pervasive that their only son is killed by the police for distributing clandestine literature. In fact, the magnitude of the violence at the time of the narrative can be measured by the fact that the burial that occurs in the opening chapter in the town's first burial of the natural causes in many years. This you can find in the text uh, previous pages the first and second pages and the reference also you can find in the fourth page so these are the examples of corruption and violence in the novella the next one is hope versus despair the theme of hope versus despair is best exemplified by the rooster which is a symbol of both forces the narrative introduces the story of the rooster to counterbalance the mostly nightmarish reality and hopelessness of the historical facts of the backdrop of no one fights to the colonel the town's doctor, the old colonel, and the townsfolk at large all put their hopes on the rooster. Thus, it serves to partially offset the tension brought about by the police and the town's martial law. But will the rooster win the fight that is yet to take place and thus save the town? The reader has to decide independently because the story ends before the rooster is scheduled to fight. At the point when the old colonel decides to keep the rooster even if it means that he and his wife must do without. The abrupt end seems absurd, but it is an absurdity that calls for examination on behalf of the reader. So this is not an absurdity. This is not a sudden end. Rather, uh, the writer leaves it to the readers so uh, to decide why that happened. So there is hope, there is despair. Perhaps in order to express that despair, in order to pinch that despair within the mind of the readers, the novel, uh, the writer did this. The old colonel and all those who pin their hopes on a victory by the rooster are simply looking for a form of victory against the oppressive government forces that control their very existence. So this becomes also symbolical on a different plane, on a different level it is explaining. When the old colonel closes the book's narrative, he feels pure and invincible at last that I mentioned at 75 years of age because he thinks he can finally win this battle. His rooster can't lose. His victory is certain. Last, he is on the verge of victory at the end of both his life and the book. So, this is the uh, simultaneous order of hope on the one hand and despair on the other hand. There is hope on in the form of rooster. There is despair at the end of the novella. There is also despair in a practical sense through the words of the colonel's wife. So, there is a continuous flux between the hope and the despair in the novella. And this serves a significant aspect of theme or thematic issues. The next one is the poverty. So another theme that injustifies suffered by the townsfolk can be immediately seen in the poverty in which the old colonel and his sick wife exist. Their house and their life, uh, lives are pathetic. They seem to be dying in quite dis uh, desperation. They lack money, possessions and essentials, etc. So poverty are all uh, in the system, in the lives of the people, the system of the town, so all are rotting. As the reader might imagine, then justifies that they suffer or also suffered by most of the townsfolk. This is certainly the case for the people at the tailor shop, the children who come to see the rooster after school, and the cockfight fanatics who save their money to be on the rooster. The crisis that the poor endure are more like a purgatory than a life. One example is the fact that the townsfolk are not free to walk by the police barracks during the procession to bury the poor musician. The townsfolk are both economically and socially oppressed. So this is an example where social and economic oppression are still in the, in the very clear picture. The injustices of the poor in general are exemplified by what happens to the old colonel. He is not merely poor. He is impoverished and let down by a social and political system that fails to pay what is legally his. His pension for having served the country. Other members of the middle class who are shown as impoverished complement and the poverty apparent in the portrait of the colonel. These include the doctor and the black toothless lawyer. The poverty of these three middle class characters is a microcosm of the poverty of the town. So they are the, just the represent, representation of the town's people. 
so the almost all of the people are poor and they are oppressed threatened so these three characters the lawyer the colonel and the doctor are uh, representative figures of all those people so they are therefore said just the microcosm um, a simple of the injustice and government that is incapable of providing or unwilling to provide for its citizens the injustices suffered by the townspeople in turn are a constant reminder of the colombia of the period when no one writes to the colonel was written this is inevitable that because literature is the reflection of society the time definitely when garcia marquez was writing no one writes to the colonel the time is again and again coming back as an issue so poverty therefore as a significant theme comes to uh, that part poverty there is the disparity of wealth uh, there is somehow the connection between the poverty and the disparity of wealth however this theme is significant in this part that uh, it is it can be recognized as the description of a relatively small group of government officials a few men who have umbrellas to protect themselves from the rain and most obviously sabas is the main character here at the time of the burial, the town's mayor is still in uh, bed clothes, a sign that he does not need to be worked to earn his money. He is described as standing on the balcony of the barracks, unshaven and swollen in his face. The men with the umbrellas also attending the musician's funeral are members of a social class that can afford to dress in white with black and ties. However, of all people, the one who has benefited the most from the knowing how to manipulate the system is Sabas. As I said, the English translation of its social title that Sabas goes by in the original Spanish, Don Sabas. The word Don before his name is an appellation of economic success. He is not just Sabas, as the English translation goes, he is Don Sabas. So he lives in a new two-story house with wrought iron window gratings. And there, from this uh, examples, so you can understand that there is a disparity of wealth. There is a differences of people. There are differences of wealth in the, in the townspeople. Although the colonel and Sabas live in the same town, they live as separate and reality as they would if they lived in two different latitudes. As the colonel and Sabas watch the rain come down, the colonel says that the rain from Sabas' window is like watching it rain in another town. Sabas is the economic antithesis of the colonel. Sabas was born rich. Both he and his town's mayor have overcome, become rich by taking advantage of the political turmoil that prevailed at a time before the narrative begins. So, from Sabas' example, uh, Garcia Marquez tries to give that social order is not always equal. So this is just a very, very, not very peculiar example of the social structure. This is a very common social structure, the common society, which gives you a picture of from everywhere. Now, no one writes to the colonel, the specific novella, in a specific way, voicing over the disparity of wealth, how that disparity of wealth is very you know, giving you the exact direction that what you need to understand. Try to understand, try to feel the differences between these people. Try to understand the disparity of wealth between these people. So although the colonel and Sabas live in the same town, therefore Sabas is somehow standard and colonel is the substandard version of Sabas. The townsfolk who, have, uh, who were persecuted had to choose between death and immigration to the urban centers. The mayor of the time threatened those who were persecuted with the loss of their poverty. To avoid this fate, they were forced to sell their lands. People like Sabas benefited by buying their properties at a half price. Don't you think this kind of fears are still happening in today's context? Yes, it is indeed. So it is not the Colombian references. It is a universal aspect. Sabas has gotten used to taking advantage of the less unfortunate and that he tells the colonel that he could sell the rooster for 400 pesos, less than half what he had originally offered. So this is how people are taking the advantages. People like Sabas. The last theme is the theme of solitude. The final theme, uh, once again, solitude that ranges throughout Garcia Marcus's work and this solitude inflicted upon the town by its geographic isolation. Its only contact with the outside world takes place once a week in the form of a male. The long wait of the colonel is another act of solitude. He is an individual have acting alone in the same way that the colonel of the leap storm acts alone to bury the foreign doctor to the novella against the will of the townspeople. If the colonel's wait is an act of solitude, 
His wife's lifestyle is even more so. She only leaves the house once to try to sell the clock and the painting. The only two possessions other than the rooster that they have left. The two of them form a couple that lives in solitude. Solitude of this old couple also evokes the solitude of the old couple in the life in the time of cholera. So there are constant references. Intertextuality is all over there. So solitude is therefore one of the significant issues of this novella. The reading and explanation of the text will be left unfinished if we do not understand its historical background. Now, War of Thousand Days, you have to understand what is its significance here. At the start of the novella, the War of Thousand Days is first reference to appear. The narrative implies that the colonel participated nearly 60 years before the time of the narrative of no one writes to the colonel in the last civil war. This reference alludes to the civil wars of 1899 to 1902. This period referred to as the War of Thousand Days resulted from a fragile and divided political structure between the liberal and conservative parties. The origin of the War of the Thousand Days may be dated back to 1863 when the Liberal Party was dominant but the Conservative Party was favored by the Federalist Constitution instituted in that same year. In Colombia at the time, it was difficult to even talk to the constitution as a single document between 1821, 11 years after Colombia gained its independence from Spain. In 1945, Colombia formulated 11 national constitutions. The ceasefire of the world, War of Thousand Days, ended with the signing of several peace treaties. The Treaty of Neerlandia, mentioned in No One Rights to the Colonel, was signed in 1902 by General Juan B. Trevor uh, of the Conservative Party and Rafael Urev Urev of the Liberal Party. In November of the, that same year, two other peace treaties were signed, but they were not mentioned in the novella. They were in the Treaty of Wincansin and the Treaty of Shinakota. As in the case in the most of Garcia Marquez's work, fiction and fact are combined in the novella. Garcia Marquez's grandfather, Marquez Iguaran, was a colonel who fought in the Civil War of 1902. Although the old colonel in No One Rights to the Colonel is modeled after Garcia Marquez's own grandfather, Colonel Aureliano Buendia in pure fiction. <laughs> Aureliano Buendia is the same colonel who features prominently in 100 Years of Solitude. So there are indeed connections. So these historical factors, without understanding these historical factors, you cannot understand No One Rights to the Colonel. In fact, the novellas and novels of Garcia Marquez. So these histories are embedded very reluctantly connected with one another. So without knowing the history, um, we should not move on to the topics of no one writes to the colonel, 100 years of solitude, or love in the time of cholera, etc. Although the town of Makondo is fictional, the historical events that occur there are based on events of 19th century combined with those that Garcia Marquez witnessed himself from 1948 to the time of the publication of No One Writes to the Colonel. The second historical factor is the departure from his hometown, Makondo. The colonel's departure from his hometown Makondo in 1906 provides another important historical development as it hints at the exploitation in Colombia by the United Fruit Company. The civil war known as the War of Thousand Days had ended in 1902 as from the previous segment we have already understood the old colonel waited patiently for this pension but after four years he had begun to despair. His despair was intensified by the arrival of the United Fruit Company finally forcing him to leave Makondo. The arrival of this so-called banana company and the large wave of newcomers that the company attracted is known as banana fever. No one writes to the colonel mentions the banana fever with which a leap storm begins. 100 years of solitude culminates with the banana strike of 1928, the year when Gabriel Garcia Marquez was born. The strike came as a result of workers receiving only poor wages, no medical benefits and no rights to organize. When the workers struck in December 1928 at the Sinaga train station, a massacre took place. The death count may or may not have been exaggerated for most accounts vary from the handful of 3,000 casualties. These new governments to Mekondo, so highly despised in the lip storm, are just memory in the old colonel's mind in the no one writes to the colonel. But the tone with which he refers to the events surrounding the banana fever remains one of uh, outrage. The odor of the banana is eating my insides. So this is somehow associated with that references referring to the uh, leaving of Makando, the hometown of the colonel. The 
next segment is killing of augustine which is the second important event the killing of augustine which the colonists only son garcia marquez's way of aesthetically writing about the violence that engulfed colombia during 1950s so this is another historical event that we need to understand that so 1950s augustine is killed in 1956 while the fictionalized town is under martial law first published in 1958 in the magazine Mito, no one writes to the colonel hints at the dictatorship of colombia's then chief of state gustavo rogers fin Inila, the brutality of the period of La Valencia. So the violence that are described in the novella and associated aspects of the violence, killing of Augustine, are also uh, historical factors. And without knowing about these historical factors, we cannot understand this novella completely. So these are the three basic historical factors that I have to give, that I have to reproduce to you in order to associate these historical factors with this novella. Now, these are also important for your writing purposes. Just mention the historical factors uh, whenever you try to attempt an answer because this will give you the background version. So if the some, somehow a little bit of background is there in your writing, your writing will be enriched naturally. Together with these textual references, you have to move towards your answers. Now, finally, it is time to move to the resources, the resources that I have gathered in after every video that I have given you several resources of the different texts. Now, these are the resources. The first one, Gertrude Moat Ricardo, The Economy of the Narrative Sign, In No One Writes to the Colonel, and In Evil Hour. In Gabriel Garcia, Garcia Marquez's And the Power of Fiction, edited Julio Ortega, the Texas Pan-American series, Austin University of Texas Press, 1988. Page number 17 to 33. The reference is a very clear reference. The second one is Carlos Alberto J. That means J. Alberto Carlos. Review of No One Writes to the Colonel and Other Stories in Critical Essays on Gabriel Garcia Marquez's edited George R. McMurray. Critical Essays on World Literature, Boston. So page number 31 to 33. There you can get the references. Third one is Richard D. Woods. Time and Futility in the novel of L. Colonel. Uh, no tiene quen le escriba in critical essays on Gabriel Garcia's Marquez edited George uh, R. McMurray, the previous one, the same editor. Critical essays on world literature, Boston, and page number 86 to 93. Next one is the analysis of Marquez and No One Writes to the Colonel by Nusrullah Mamur. There I have already given you the URL, so by clicking the URL, you can also get the information. The next one is a semiotic interpretation of Garcia Marquez's No One Writes to the Colonel by Donald de Socha that you can get anywhere. The last one is No One Writes to the Colonel, a study of sociopolitical cynicism and individuals under the impact of martial law and under the impact of inevitable forces by global capitalism by Kuldeep Singh. There you can find necessary materials if you want. So these are the complete segments. These are the total aspects so far from no one writes to the colonel if you are anyhow or somehow enriched i will be grateful and therefore thank you all for this wait to watch the video and stay blessed keep yourself healthy until the next video comes good day